Okay. Um, so I will apologize first that I didn't wear my pink shirt today. Um, I accidentally spilled a little wine on it, and I figured it would probably be more appropriate not to wear that. It's something that's being streamed live and talking to all of you about the new UI work. Um, but um, I'm kind of telling a story and several parts here, as well as kind of getting you up to speed with where we started from last year and where we're going next, and what has gone into this decision process and, um, and why, um, why we've kind of come to the conclusion that we've come to. So last year, if you were at Open Repositories or you saw my slides, I had this slide. Um, this is a complete copy from last year. Um, I said, you know, last year we're going to prototype two to three platforms, and one's going to be Java-based, and one's going to be non-Java-based, and we're going to figure all this stuff out, and, you know, this was the general schedule. And, all. and while we didn't follow that exact schedule, per se, some of the timelines are a little bit off, um, this is essentially what has happened in the last year, and even beyond that. So we said two to three UI platforms, one Java, one non-Java. Um, in reality, what ends up, ended up happening is after open repositories, we established a user interface working group, uh, mostly uh, committers, uh, DCAT members, and uh, folks uh, on steering or leadership. Um, they helped us establish a user interface prototype challenge, which you may have heard of, uh, through the lists and all of that. We had an amazing number of nine submissions, not two to three. We had nine different prototypes submitted from our community from eight different institutions. Uh, the logos you see down here are where they kind of um, fell in terms of technology. So we had some Java ones. We had a couple that were JavaScript, uh, namely Ember.js and uh, Angular 1. And we had some Ruby ones as well. Um, after that process in December, of course, there's uh, holiday break there for a lot of folks, um, and we kind of uh, picked up right after the holidays and jumped in in January and February and had each of these nine developers come and do a live demo, which we recorded all of these. They're all up on the wiki. Um, if you want to go back and see that historic stuff, we also started to get, well, historic, it was six months ago. Um, <laughs> we also started to gather public feedback from all of you. We put out a public feedback form, uh, Google Doc, where we asked for your input on these prototypes. Um, what you liked, what you didn't like, um, what, what things were of interest or concerning. Um, right away, we narrowed options here. Um, oh, and I should mention my little logo over here. This is me. It's an older picture now at this point in time. But uh, I built one of the Java ones, and that's why this is, where, this is where the story starts to begin. I was very firmly in the Java camp. I built a Java prototype here, Spring Boot proto prototype, um, pretty firmly where my mind sat in January and February. Uh, and we narrowed down, narrowed out Ruby pretty early on, not because we didn't like Ruby, but, but because it's an, a, a technology that um, within our core sort of group, we didn't have as much Ruby expertise. Uh, we also found that there were not as many distinct advantages to Ruby over Java or JavaScript. So um, it was hard to make an argument for why we would suddenly jump to a different, a, a different server side um, platform that was not Java. And so that kind of got um, pushed aside then early on, and we said, Let, let's really start to concentrate on this Java and JavaScript. There's some promise here. Let's see where we, we can go with this. Um, so these UI discussions then began. They were pretty in-depth, um, and uh, they kept going on in the UI working group. We had some other people pop on and off on uh, these meetings little by little. Uh, they were bubbling up into the steering and leadership groups through February and March, and it really became that Java versus JavaScript question. So we had these two JavaScript technologies, Java on the other side, and, um, and we started to narrow down what the real pros and cons are of these platforms. Why would we want to do Java? Why would we want to do JavaScript? What can we see as um, the benefits of each, the detriments of each? Um, and it came down to sort of um, on the Java side of things, we saw that it's, it's really stable, trusted, it's known in our community. Uh, it would be the same backend as our API. We could do everything you know, in one language. Um, it, we could do it on a more modern Java technology. We could use something like Spring Boot or whatever else. Um, so we could, be, we could get a lot of benefits right out of Java. We went with a Java user interface, built it on a newer technology. But we kept having these questions bubbling up um, through folks around, is this really all that innovative? Is there as much added value here? If we want to build a modern user interface, we're going to need a lot of JavaScript and things like that to kind of make it a little flashy, make it more interactive. We're still going to have to build that on top of this. Um, are, are we going far enough? Um, are we building something that we can excite new developers around? Um, so we had already been receiving some feedback through the feedback forms and things and, and in the last few years around 
uh, in some areas of the world, it's harder and harder to get good Java developers. Uh, so you want to customize. Are you going to be able to do that as easily if we build it all in Java again? Um, so there's some, some questions that were starting to bubble up. They weren't, they weren't you know, groundbreaking different questions. They weren't things that were like, uh, uh, we're going to hit a wall. You know, we could still move forward if we wanted to there. Um, but on the JavaScript side, there was a little bit of a different nature, of course. It's much more dynamic. You can build a more dynamic interface in a jo JavaScript platform. And it was proven very well through our two prototypes um, in JavaScript through, uh, from Atmire and Texas A&M, who, who led those two prototypes. They showed off what we could do in that to achieve a better user experience, to, to kind of move the platform forward. It would also really force us to do a separation of concerns. What that means is that it would make us pull apart our user interface and have a REST API that actually could be used more than just kind of in proof of concept nature. I mean, people use it, but it, it doesn't give all the features of that Java API. So it forces us to kind of do some things that DSpace needs going forward to make it more interoperable, work with more systems. Um, but there were some significant questions here. Um, and that's worth pointing out. We, we hit some bl block, blocks right away with these two technologies, with Ember.js. Um, I forget what version this was. Um, I'll have to ask uh, Art later on. But uh, with the version of Ember.js we were doing and Angular 1, we hit some blocks in terms of we found out immediately it wasn't really search engine compliant. Um, and there are search engines who can handle JavaScript, can uh, these old, this, uh, this older JavaScript, they can run the JavaScript, they can in index it, all that sort of stuff. Um, but we were having issues with that with the initial prototypes. Um, there were questions about whether or not, you know, accessibility, most screen readers these days can do JavaScript. That can sometimes still trip things up a little bit. Uh, we had more proven out that it could meet our needs uh, because of these prototypes, but there were still some that were, may have been questioning that along, the t along that period in time. Meanwhile, um, while we are having all these internal discussions, Angular 1 um, had suddenly gone to Angular 2, 2.0 beta, um, back in December. So we never prototyped on this. We did Angular 1. Um, it wasn't SEO compliant. But Angular 2 came along and they said, look, we're a JavaScript UI. We are the most widely used JavaScript framework out there. We support SEO. We can do everything. We can give um, search, engine, search engines will uh, be able to index us because we'll, we can compile the JavaScript server side automatically. Uh, we care about accessibility. We want to make that a high priority. Um, all this is sort of up there on their features on the Angular I.O. website that I have here on the bottom um, for what Angular 2 was selling. And so we heard this and we were like, you know, hey, this, this is sounding kind of interesting. Kind of wish we would have had a chance to prototype on that. Maybe we should look at that a little bit more. And at the Duraspace Summit in mid-March, that's the sort of discussion that started to come about. I was kind of more on the fence now. I had heard about Angular 2 at this point in time. I was like, you know, there's interesting stuff there. I can see the benefit of JavaScript, uh, but we don't know, you know, what we can't really prove. Um, so, at the summit, um, at the summit, we had these discussions with the steering and the leadership group. We've had some good feedback that they saw a lot of promise in the JavaScript um, nature, but that Java was still sort of our safety net. If, if we couldn't really do anything in JavaScript, um, if, it, if there was something we hit in terms of a wall there, and at that summit, we had four institutions stand up. Um, well, not really stand up; we're sitting around a table, but they raised their hand and said. <laughs> Um, Texas A&M, who built a uh, JavaScript prototype um, for us. Atmire, who built a JavaScript prototype for us. Chineka, who built a Java prototype for us. And myself from Duraspace and Jonathan Marco was helping as well from Duraspace. And I built a Java prototype. So we had two institutions building JavaScript, two that built Java. And we came together and said, okay, look, let's do an extended prototype and we need to look at Angular 2 more. See if there is some promise here. See if, see if there's something that... Um, that could actually really benefit us here for the, for the long term. Um, so this is where we came to a building a proof of concept user interface. And I'm going to give you a live demo here. <laughs> We're going to see how well a live demo works. Uh, it is running on my laptop. So, um, but it's worth noting a couple things before I get into that. So um, it's a proof of concept user interface that we built in uh, two and a half months, and this includes us learning Angular 2. So uh, one group, Texas A&M, knew Angular 1, and so they were able to help us along a little bit. The rest of us uh, did not really know Angular 2. We had to ramp up. We had to move quickly. We had four very part-time developers trying to do this, we, you know, meeting on a weekly basis, checking up, um, trying to get our, um, trying to figure out who, what you're going to do for the next week, um, reporting back. Uh, so these are the people who are involved. Uh, the folks in green here, William Welling did an uh, amazing amount of work from Texas A&M um, 
on this, as well as Art and Dylan uh, from Atmire. I was involved from Duraspace and the programming side because I wanted to get my feet wet. I wanted to get into this. I admit I did not do nearly as much as uh, William and Dylan and Art did, but I did do um, some features in here to, to kind of get my feet wet, understand how this all would work and, and what it all looks like. James Creel, uh, uh, Andrea, uh, Andrea Bellini, and uh, Jonathan Marka were all there to uh, help, uh, help as consul consultants, sort of, uh, kind of help us along with the process, make sure that we were hitting all of the bases, that we were answering all the questions that we needed to answer, um, and coming to a good conclusion here, coming up to open repositories. So here's where I'm going to show a demo. And there is a public demo if you want to try things out. You're, you're not going to be able to log in yet. Uh, you can run this locally. The code's all out there on GitHub, um, as I had shown in the previous slide up there at the top, under our DSpace Labs GitHub uh, repository. But there's a public demo um, here that you can uh, go and play around with if you want to. I'm going to be running this off locally off of my laptop. And the reason I'm doing that is because I wasn't sure how well Wi-Fi was going to hold up and if a bunch of people jumped on, if things would get really slow. Um, so let me see if I can get, oh, and of course it's going to do the same thing to me. I have to move my browser window over to This is going to be interesting. <laughs> now, how am I going to do a public demo like this? Um, let me just try something really quick. Uh, trying to see if I can get myself so I'm not mirror or I don't have two screens side by side. Uh, okay, we're just going to wing it. Here's what I'm going to do. Testing. Does anybody have a microphone that works? I'm going to be kind of weird and turn around and face you guys so I can actually see the screen. <laughs> but it's going to be what's going to be necessary. Uh, it's okay. There's something below it. There's something below it. It's here. Okay. So what we got here. Uh, I just unhooked my connector. Okay. That's not going to work. Okay, we're going to do it backwards then still, if I have to do it that way. Yeah, I was trying to get it figured out here, and for some reason I can't find the right setting on my own Windows machine, which is kind of a pain. Should we go to the desktop? Desktop? And then right click on it. And then there should be display settings. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Let's see here. And we want to do... And Multiple displays, not extend, duplicate. Thank you. <laughs> I did not. Let's see here. Keep changes. Thank you very, very much. And now let me get this Windows thing out of the way. Perfect. Okay, we are good. Um, uh, so. This is the, um, again, a proof of concept user interface. The goal here was not to build every single feature um, in DSpace. The goal was to prove out that we could do the things we want to do in Angular 2 to achieve a DSpace user interface here. Um, and that's kind of important because um, we built this all based on the DSpace 5 REST API. Uh, DSpace 6, at the time when we started, um, was you know, pretty far along, but the REST API still had a couple little issues there, so we decided right away that we wanted to do DSpace 5 and actually also be able to point it at some production sites to see data uh, right away. Um, so this is what we came up with. It's on Bootstrap. It's not super pretty, but, um, but Art did a good job here, and Dylan um, from Atmire helping us kind of make this look a little bit nicer. So we got the usual, you know, mobile stuff here. Uh, fancy, fancy. Um, we got, uh, <laughs> we got uh, the news here um, at the front, and then we got our little browse um, community and collections and items. So I'm, I'm working off a very small, um, uh, well, not a small laptop, but a small D space here um, in terms of I just have six items right now, a, couple, a collection and a community. Um, but we've got basic browse pages for each, so you can jump into a collection of, of items, and we've got our items listed here. Uh, currently, we don't have thumbnails enabled in here but you can go in any of this sort of stuff. That's just sort of the normal browse experience of DSpace, but 
um, in a new environment. Uh, the one thing to point out here, though, uh, remember there was those SEO concerns. Uh, we wanted to be able to prove out that search engine optimization worked. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, we wanted to be able to prove that uh, Google Scholar's needs, which were the most strict that we could find, were met. Um, so we talked to Anurag, a Google Scholar, and had him actually test out our live demo um, up there in that public thing. And then I'm going to find, what am I looking for here? Where's my JavaScript? Well, that's not what I wanted. I want my developer tools. Um, so uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, Google Scholar's needs were met. And Google Scholar basically told us flat out, look, if you have any JavaScript in your site, we're not going to run it. Um, we ignore it. Um, so if you're a JavaScript site, um, you're really not going to get much of your site indexed if you're totally built by JavaScript. So what we wanted to be able to do is actually prove out that this site worked completely with JavaScript turned off. And so that's what I'm going to do right now, is turn off. There's the settings I want. Oh, and I'm disabled. Good. Okay. Get this out of the way. So this little icon up here that I'm pointing to with my mouse is that JavaScript is disabled currently. And again, I'm running a JavaScript user interface. Let me go back to the home. Um, and I can go ahead and just browse around to my heart's content. And everything is still working in terms of uh, being able to interact with the site. And, and this is very important because this is exactly what Google Scholar's robots would see. They want to be able to see a site that is actually usable um, to their robots with JavaScript completely turned off. Um, and so we, we talked with Anurag about that. He ran, um, let me turn my JavaScript back on here, if I can get it going. Okay. Um, I, we talked to Anurag, and he, uh, he uh, did some testing on his end to make sure that everything was coming up properly, that we were able to, that he was able to index our, our sample site. And um, he had little feature, little uh, requests here and there in terms of, oh, this isn't quite working quite as well as DSpace currently does, and da 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 da. But the basics all worked, and that was the most important question. It wasn't, can we get it as good as DSpace yet, because this is really a proof of concept, and because there are things in, that are not in the REST API yet. Uh, that we would need to achieve the, the full SDO capability because um, that REST API layer is still um, limited. But we got that good feedback from Google Scholar that, yes, this is working. And this was the first time Google Scholar had actually tested out with Angular 2 um, from my talking with Anurag. Um, but I'm going to log in here and show off some of what else we actually have because that's the more important stuff is once we're uh, logged in here, what we have here. So... Okay, so I'm logged in as an admin account. Another thing we wanted to be able to prove here, I do have my JavaScript turned back on um, now because there are some features that don't fully work with JavaScript off, um, the, the, some of the flashy animations, things like that. You'll still get the basic site experience, but not everything works. And it was good enough for what Google Scholar needs. All the public access stuff is work, works completely with JavaScript turned off. Um, but in, tor in order to um, do some other sort of uh, proof of concept work that we were trying to do in this, we wanted to be able to prove out that we could do things like, okay, so one of the big claims of JavaScript and that we're shown off in our JavaScript prototypes is that we can do things more dynamically. We can do some dynamic editing. We can um, achieve things in a different way than we've done them um, within DSpace. So DSpace obviously has a lot of backend config files. We want to try and get away, with that, get away from that. Um, and uh, start to move towards like admin UI sort of capabilities, being able to tweak things from your admin UI. So one of the things we did um, that was done is this little edit sidebar here. So you can see my sidebar here. We got an account area, just has login, logout, and admin area, which right now is just an edit sidebar just for the proof of concept. We have this link section, and I have a link here to OR16 right now. Um, but I can dynamically create new sections. You can notice, look at my sidebar as I'm typing this in. Uh, so let's just do, um, whoops. And notice how everything's changing as I type. Uh, the reason why we wanted to prove this out, so um, not only for the dynamic aspect, but what's actually happening here behind the scenes, which you cannot necessarily um, see here live, is that it's actually, when I save this, so right now, normal users wouldn't be seeing those edits live. But as soon as you save it, it's actually saving to a configuration file on the back end. 
So if I reload my site, or if other users now, you know, go back to your site, they're going to see this new text section. If I close down this browser completely and go back, it's saved because it's actually editing a, a configuration file on the server side. So it's more dynamically editing a configuration and changing it within the menu um, at the same point in time, which is something we wanted to be able to achieve because it's stuff we've wanted to do in DSpace for a long time. Um, and it could be done in Java, but it's it's going to be a little bit more complex to achieve some of this. And again, this is just one thing we achieved in two and a half months with uh, four, four, four part-time folks. So that's the dynamic aspect. Another thing that we wanted to do, okay, so say you have a much more uh, complex, let me go back to the home. Say you want to uh, uh, want to deal with more complex um, uh, configuration files on the back end. A good example of doing some more complex work in configuration or things that requires con complex configuration is actually the item creation screen. And we did not build the entire workflow process into this. As I mentioned here briefly, um, it's not available within the REST API right now. So what we limited ourselves to doing is just having a basic item creation form that is driven though, however, from back-end configuration files. And I just proved that I can edit back-end configuration files dynamically um, from the sidebar. Um, and now I'm just uh, showing off a basic form that is kind of like an input forms thing with DSpace right now, um, but you could imagine it could be dynamically changed from, um, from admin UI. Um, in this case, it's not actually going to be dynamically changed because um, we didn't get that far. But we did get a cool, some cool little features here. Uh, we got a form that's a basic form here. You can notice right away we got a little drag and drop thing up here, fancy, fancy. Uh, we do have a type, select a type of what you're putting in here. So if I look at my metadata, I've got just some generic fields, title, author, publication dates, public, publisher. Let's say I'm going to put in a thesis. If I wanted to submit a thesis, you really want an advisor. So I'm dynamically changing the fields on this page based on what type of document you want to deal with. And we have this for several different types. Most of them right now are very uh, generic. We just have title description when you change this. The default shows most everything. But it allows you to uh, kind of imagine where you could go with this um, in terms of, of moving the DSpace user experience forward as well as being able to modify these more dynamically on the, uh, uh, from the user interface and have a better experience. So on the back end, these are all uh, JSON configuration files. Um, and uh, with the sidebar, we were dynamically editing a JSON configuration file. In this case, we're just dynamically changing between which JSON configuration file we're going to use. And you can imagine we could edit those more dynamically um, in the future as well. Uh, another feature that we wanted to kind of play around with was, um, oh wait, actually I want to show, I'll just show off the drag and drop stuff just because the JSP UI has this, but... Uh, but uh, XML UI does not. So I can pull a file over, do all that fancy stuff. Um, and then I'm just going to do a something that just has a title. I think book just gives me requires. Oh, and we can also change what uh, fields are required. I should show that if I can find my editor. Sorry, you can tell this is a really live demo because I'm having trouble on my tiny screen finding all the things that I wanted to find. Um, oh, wait, well, that's coming up here. Uh, come on, Adam. You know you want to start up. There we are. Okay, so I do want to show really quickly that, <laughs> uh, that these are all, so these are the, the type forms right here. We have these uh, various type forms uh, stored on the back end. This is looking at the backend configuration files. These are JSON just because JavaScript deals more with JSON um, and can interact with it easier, so we just want something quick. Um, but what we, what we have here is this capability to, um, to specify, you know, what field is this having to do with, uh, do like the you know, normal, uh, this is the pretty name for it. It's going to be a text box. Um, this one's not going to be repeatable, but maybe other ones could. Oh, and let's make some validation rules. Let's say, you know, this, this is required and it must have uh, at least four characters and can only be 128. These are all things you could change dynamically, if you can imagine that, um, uh, because this is all JSON and, and JavaScript is great at ch changing JSON on the back end. Um, so that's like one of the forms, that thesis form, and we've done that, that sort of configura configurability um, in that back end uh, area but it then allows us to do that sort of validation. 
So I can just say, I can start typing some characters. Okay, the title needs to be at least four characters like we just defined there. Now if it went over 128, it would do that. I'm not going to sit here and type in front of you, though. Um, test PDF or PPP. Okay, so I've got a, oh, it is a PDF. Oh, well. Uh, so we got a test upload here from, uh, from open repositories. We'll go ahead and submit that. Um, we've got a progress bar as we're uploading our file, and it's taking a little longer on my local machine, it looks like. Okay, it should be done. There we go. Uh, so we uploaded it successfully. Uh, we can go ahead and scroll down here into our collection and see our test upload from OR16. And we have a little bit of overlap here because my screen is so small, but we got our file. Um, basic metadata, uh, nothing was really specified there. So that's just the upload process, of course, just an example of that. Um, something else we achieved. Uh, the last thing I do want to show off is another sort of JavaScript-y, something that's a little bit easier to achieve in a JavaScript realm uh, rather than in, um, in a um, back-end realm. Could still achieve it there. but so. Uh, we have a, uh, an existing item, okay, a test web page, some files, some, uh, some uh, metadata here. I'm going to go in here and go ahead and edit this. And now I can actually do uh, inline editing here. So we can say, if there's only specific fields you want to touch and change, you can go ahead and just change those um, inline within the, oh, my browser has pushed it down. And so you can contrast this to the editing experience within DSpace right now, um, where it's a lot more difficult to figure out where things are going to sit on the page, how things are going to line up, um, and how to actually you know, go in and edit stuff. Um, but so this is one other feature that we added here. Um, everything is not perfect. This is not 100% bug free. It's all supposed to be a proof of concept to show off what we can achieve here uh, going forward within Angular 2. So that's my quick uh, prototype here. And with only about 20 minutes left, I'm going to jump back to slides. And start my talk up. If everything went horribly long, I had screenshots. But it didn't go horribly wrong, other than the little thing up there, the Windows 10 stuff. Uh, so, uh, so what we proved out during this process was that search engine optimization was possible. If we wanted to do Angular 2, we proved it out with Google Scholar. Um, while we were doing this, uh, stra uh, not strangely, but Coincidentally, one day, somebody on IRC, I was out there um, from University of Kansas, pinged me and said, hey, have you looked into accessibility? Has it proved, have you proven out the accessibility need? Uh, no, not quite. We've done a little bit with it. And so they ran it through their, their accessibility uh, team locally at University of Kansas and came back with very few issues, none major. They said it was just tiny stuff that we could tweak just to improve it, but everything's looking good. And we're like, great, okay, that's excellent. So we're, we're doing well in accessibility. We just need to keep on top of that, keep it moving forward as we're, um, as we're getting this interface moving forward as well. Um, I, show that, I showed already that obviously we can achieve some better user experience in terms of editing things dynamically, um, changing um, stuff on the fly, making things more configurable from the user interface. And of course, everything is still job on the back end here. I'm running this, I'm running the uh, Angular 2 app on my Windows machine. Um, I've got a, a virtual machine running here as well that's running Linux, and that's where my DSpace 5 REST API and a regular DSpace 5, out of the box DSpace 5, is running. Uh, and that's what I just showed off there. So now we come to today. I am very, very firmly in the Angular 2 camp. <laughs> everybody I've talked to is very, very firmly, uh, or everybody on this prototype has been very, very firmly over in the JavaScript Angular 2 camp. We need to, we need to be doing this. Um, this is where the future of DSpace can really be achieved in a much more easy fashion um, than trying to build this um, still on a Java platform with lots of layers of JavaScript on top of it. Um, but as of uh, just a little while ago, two, three weeks ago, Angular 2 has now released its first release candidate. It's not out in production, that's worth noting, but there are sites using it already in production, a couple of them here. Uh, Capital One and uh, weather.com. Uh, Google is moving most of their uh, products over like Google AdWords and things like that um, as we speak. 
Um, so it's, it's moving forward very, very rapidly. I expect the final release of Angular 2 will probably be out um, sometime this summer. There's not a firm date on that. They've promised definitely this year, but it's moving so rapidly that I'm, I'm guessing it's probably going to be sometime this summer or early fall. Um, and I should mention that in that two and a half months of us achieving all of that, we also were working with a beta uh, for the, most of that time, other than the last few weeks. We, we kept hitting little things in that beta, as you may imagine. A beta is not perfect. Uh, we hit little things, so we always had to hit little bugs. We reported them back. We gave more feedback back to, um, ang to the Angular team and, um, and kept that process going. But that was also a part of building all of this. And it's kind of brought us to the fact of, you know, if you're not convinced, why really should we be using Angular 2? Here's a couple reasons why I think it's very important. Um, first off, uh, Angular is the most popular framework out there. This is Angular 1. Angular 2 is still new, but there's a massive adoption moving towards Angular 2, and I don't perceive that um, Angular is going to lose their, their massive user base anytime soon. Um, Angular 1 has extensive third-party modules. Angular 2 has a lot of them already um, and more in the works. We used about three or four to achieve what we've done up there in terms of file upload modules, bootstrap modules, other things um, to achieve this very quickly. Angular 2 is also ex um, surprisingly Java-like. Um, it's amazing the experience of working with Angular 2 as a Java programmer, but at the same point in time, it's stuff that JavaScript folks can really get into. There's this idea of everything on the web page is a component. You can extend components. You can move things around much easier to edit your in user interface however you want. And as I showed, um, um, well, there's also HTML-like templates, uh, which makes it easy to customize as well. And as I showed, you don't need to be running JavaScript on the client to actually even use Angular 2. Um, this is the everything as a component sort of idea here that uh, all of these, uh, this is the home page. So the sidebar is its own component. Sidebar consists of sidebar sections. You can move those around as you need. There's a breadcrumb component that controls where you are within the application. There's a news component. There's a tree component. You can extend components in a way such that you could have a, a basic tree that deals with communities and collections, but maybe I want items to look a little bit different when I have a list of items or a tree of items. So I can just extend that component and change it very slightly for items um, to make it look how I want it to look. And that will all still work within this, this whole framework. Um, but uh, one of the questions, I guess, out of this, one of my questions that I would assume you'd want to be asking is, how do we get here? What are we going next? What's the plan here? Um, and I want to, I'm rushing here a little bit because I want to make sure I have plenty of time for questions, and I realize we're getting short uh, with my demo. Uh, but uh, the roadmap to 7 is essentially two main points. It's that REST API point. The REST API is not fully there to build a full UI on, but we need to get it there. Um, and this is an important thing, not only for the new user interface, but also for interacting with other tools. It means we can open up integrations in ways that we've not been able to because uh, our REST API is not fully baked to the extent that it, it really should be. Um, and, and this is us using our own tools. We're going to be using the REST API heavily. Everything we need out of the REST API should enable other people to build their own tools on that same REST API. DSpace 7 um, will also feature a single user interface. Um, that means that uh, we will not be bringing forward any of the old user interfaces as soon as the Angular 2 user interface is ready to go. Um, and that's an important concept for our community because it will allow our community to move more rapidly in the same direction. For too long we've been trying to um, work with two parallel code bases at a UI level, and it really hampers our development process. It, it hampers our ability to add the features that people actually want and, a, and the ability to redesign interfaces. All of that has been hampered by this process of doing too much in parallel. The timeline goals would be to have a beta and training um, by next open repositories. We'd start training on this new user interface, what it looks like, how you can customize it um, to meet your needs. Um, all that sort of stuff, with a final version out um, hopefully in late 2017. But this is not something we can do ourselves. Uh, we need your help. Uh, this is not only the committers um, that I'm call putting out a call to, but it is the committers as well. But we would really like institutions who want to help us work rapidly towards enhancing the REST API and the ways that we need it enhanced, and that could be Java developers or anybody interested in that. 
We want people who are interested in helping us build that next user interface off of this prototype, this proof of concept. And that could be JavaScript developers or people who just want to learn, who want to dig in and play around and try this all out. We'd love to have some user interface user experience designers to help us make this a much better user experience to really kind of turn DSpace on its head and see what we can do to achieve a better experience for repository managers, for the users, um, for sysadmin, for all those sort of people. Um, we want some uh, continued accessibility testing. Uh, I think we're going to get that along the way as well, but we want to make sure that we're meeting all the accessibility needs that we strive for DSpace. And eventually, obviously, we'll be getting to needing more and more translators. I'll mention we did actually prove out the translation thing as well. Uh, we do have internationalization in our proof of concept. I didn't show that off. Um, but we can achieve internationalization uh, within Angular 2 as well. Um, so if you want to join, email me, contact me. Um, the goal here is to work um, pretty rapidly in sprint-like, sort of more organized in a, in a way than we've worked in the past. It's not going to be, let's wait around and see what comes to us. It's going to be, this is what we need, and let's see how we can achieve it. And who wants to grab this and take this little piece? And who wants to grab this little piece and take this? And let's go off and move this thing forward as quickly as we can. Um, another aspect of this is... Um, honestly, I mean, I said this in all my talks these days, but uh, we'd also encourage uh, funds as well. If you don't have a developer that you want to give or you don't have thoughts you want to give on the user experience or whatever else, um, you can also help by funding us. <laughs> so uh, that's another way to give back. Um, financial contributions are critical for DSpace. They help fund my role. Um, if we had more of them, we could fund more, uh, more Tims or more whoever we need um, to work on this. Um, and it also gives you more of a say in the roadmap and governance if that's of, of interest to your institution. I should mention as well, uh, before we get to questions here, that we've been doing, well, I've been doing uh, DSpace videos off this YouTube of our constant progress as we've been leading up here to open repositories. If you hadn't seen those posts um, that started probably about a month ago or so, um, then uh, you should go back and go ahead and watch those videos. I plan to continue that process so we can keep the community in the loop where we're going, um, where we're at, um, and get questions as we go and comments and suggestions as we go. So stay tuned to the YouTube channel. I'll keep posting and spamming the list with that sort of stuff uh, to keep you all involved as well. Um, but that's it. That's it for me. Um, hopefully I left enough time for questions. And I should mention I'll be around all week still, too, if you can't get me now. <laughs> I'm sure there are questions. Okay, first, Tim and all the others, I would like to thank you for leapfrogging towards the state of the art in web development. Mm -hmm. It's really awesome to see. Thank you very much for that. Excellent. And yes. um, I'm, I have a question regarding the build process. Okay. Um, will it stay with Maven and then an AND phase in, in building? Um, Are you preferably planning? Probably not, but that needs to still be worked out. With the proof of concept, we really were just trying to build against the existing DSpace 5. Um, so for the, the future, um, I showed this to, I've got some extra slides here at the end to, that I showed to the committers earlier this week. And I had proposed this. This is not by any means final, and it's a vastly simplified model for DSpace 7. It doesn't speak to the build process, but I want to find ways to to simplify our architecture even further, um, namely moving uh, the, all of our various web apps into a single web app that can uh, be that back-end web app, which can simplify the build process and simplify the upgrade process and try and be able to get to the point where we can cut Ant out and cut things off that we don't need to be doing during that installation. I don't have an exact answer, but my, the goal is to get there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what awesome. I can promise. Really. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Not, not technical uh, this time. Okay. Uh, 
Um, you're, uh, you're talking about uh, a sprint-based uh, based approach uh, for uh, de development, o okay. Um, mm -hmm. But um, do, do you already have uh, 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 a documented backlog with, uh, with uh, uh, at least expected uh, due dates for uh, uh, some given functionalities, uh, either uh, in the, the REST API or in the, the web interface or so on? Um, that will be what, we're work what I'll be working on right after open repositories. Um, the goal up till now, because we only had this two and a half months to train, do a prototype, get our decision made. It was all about getting here and showing you guys what we had. Um, so the next stage is going back and doing the detailed planning of these are the things that are missing in the REST API that we need to achieve, and let's you know, earmark each of those and see who we can get interested in those. These are the things we want to achieve next in the user interface to start to actually move it into being more DSpace-like um, in nature. Um, and I don't mean DSpace-like in the, the old way of doing things, but I mean DSpace-like in actually meeting all the same features, um, things of that nature. Uh, so that will be happening right after open repositories. So we're not there yet. Okay, good. I just forgot to ask, uh, to, to ask you uh, when we met on Monday. <laughs> when we met on Monday? Yeah. Um, this was the DCAT and developer meeting um, that was a workshop. It was listed as a workshop, but yeah. Yeah, so I presented a version of this there and talked it through with the DCAT and committer folks in that meeting, which is where some of the extra slides that get a little bit more technical are, and I didn't have time to do them here. Yep, where? Oh, it's not. Mark. Um, just for the future, to move to a richer data metadata format that is on our roadmap going forward. It's probably not going to be, unless we, uh, so I should answer this in a, in a way, um, in, in two different ways. So right now it's not currently on the roadmap for DSpace 7 to enhance the metadata uh, capabilities of the underlying DSpace. However, if somebody is very interested in helping make that happen, I think it, there's opportunities there because it is of high interest to others in the community. Um, so if we get enough community members interested in helping try and achieve that, um, it could happen in parallel to some of these other efforts. Um, but if we, uh, but otherwise it's not really a part of that DSpace roadmap because of the fact that there is so many things that we'll have to do at the REST API level and to build the whole new user interface. And we want to achieve this as quickly as possible. You saw this is only a, a year and a half timeline, which is pretty quick to build a whole user interface uh, uh, a whole new user interface. Um, but I think it's achievable if we can get folks behind it. So it's really the highest priority of those two things. And then after that, other things like enhancing metadata and stuff like that will, will pop up to the top. Yep. Oh, Andrea. Andrea's back there behind you. You don't want to walk all the way down and come back? <laughs> Hi, just to stress the uh, discussion about uh, rich data model in this space, on uh, Monday we have had a workshop and also we start uh, a discussion between this space and this space Chris, that is an extension that uh, just try to address some of the major issue of the database of uh, the data model. So I, I want again to offer all our uh, availability as this space Chris developer to work to with the community to give a, a rich data model to, to the space. So in this regard, for instance, we are completely available to provide REST API for the space Chris to move ahead with, uh, to forward to the space seven 
user interface. So if you fall in that there is a need of a rich, uh, user, a rich data model in this space, please join the conversation on the developer mailing list and try to see if this space, Chris, the, uh, our current idea can fit uh, your requirements. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. And I should mention that DSpace Chris discussion is just in the start. So we're, we're talking about how to bring more of that data model, that richer data model, into DSpace out of the box, is what Andrea is pointing out. And so there will be many more discussions within DCAT, developers on the mailing list that will be coming with that. Over there. Okay. We have oh, we one have minute. So a couple oh, of questions. Yeah. I'm sorry if you've already discussed this and I missed it, but is there any plan to integrate with IIIF? APIs? I would love to do that, but I, I, we need, uh, we need uh, folks who can help move that forward. I'm going to be busy enough trying to get uh, these two tasks done up here and getting everybody else moving with that, but I would love to see uh, IIIF um, integration with DSpace, yes. So, yeah, if, if there's other common folks who are interested in that, I would encourage you to try and get together and let's see if we can make that happen. Okay. No, I think we're good. Excellent. Well, thank you all. <laughs> Thanks very much.